I know that you get wild and angry You fight your battles all down the line But you're the queen of my imagination You exist or outside of time That's beautiful. I like I like the lyrics a lot and the instrumentals. Well done, so as you can see, love stories they do not happen only in books or in Lucifer magazine, but also at the European School of Theosophy. <laughs> so uh, welcome everyone to one more Sunday lecture of the European School of Theosophy. My name is Erika Georgiadis and I am part of the team of the school. The school was founded in 1981 by Geoffrey Farvin and others. This year, we will focus on the study of the secret doctrine. We will also be offering lectures, online courses, and seminars on a variety of topics. To keep updated on our program, please register to our weekly newsletter. Uh, the online lectures are also transmitted live on our YouTube channel. And you can register to our channel by visit the link you will soon see on the chat option. A healing circle has been organized, facilitated by Juliet Bates, that will meet once per month. We just met one hour before, and it was a beautiful um, healing circle, very, very inspiring also. If you would like to participate or wish to include a name in our healing book, simply send an email to usdosophy at gmail.com. And I'm sorry, I have some dogs here and they are barking. Um, so we also wish to invite you to join next Saturday the fascinating seminar on navigating the battle of life, focusing on the Bhagavad Gita by Dr. Ravi Ravindra that will last for seven Saturdays. The book with the Proceedings of the European School of Theosophy 2019, Reincarnation, Science, and the Ancient Wisdom Tradition is now available both on Kindle and in printed format from Amazon. Also the Practical Vegetarian Cookery edited by Countess Weichmaster and Kate, Kate, Kate Davis. Uh, this was the first vegetarian cookbook published in California. We have lots going on, so please support this great work by, if possible, by making a don uh, donation to the European School of Theosophy, which is a not-for-profit platform. The way today's meeting will be conducted is that your microphones will be muted and you will not be able to unmute yourself. 
After the presentation, if you would like to ask a question, you can either write it or use the raise hand icon option on the chat. Your microphone will be then unmuted so that you can ask your question. Thank you for listening. Now it's my honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, today's speaker, Tim White. He is an esoteric writer, lecturer, researcher, and organizer, a broadcast and print journalist for half a century. He has won awards for his plays and TV documentaries. He has produced numerous TV films and currently writes for various esoteric publications worldwide. He is the author of more than 50 books, including Cycles of Eternity, an overview of the ageless wisdom distributed to more than 40 countries. As an international lecturer for the Theosophical Society and other organizations, he travels widely across Europe. He is the founder of the School of Applied Wisdom based in Leeds and also helps to run the Leeds Theosophical Society. He has been a lifelong student of esoteric ideas and occult science and is a dedicated explorer of consciousness. He is a lover of the natural world and lives in the Yorkshire Pennines with his cat Electra. Welcome once more, Tim, and you may begin, please. Okay, thank you uh, very much uh, indeed, Erica, and uh, welcome everybody this afternoon. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that, you know, I do, uh, as you know, have uh, a number of close companions and many friends within the Theosophical Society. My closest immediate uh, companion at the moment is my cat, Electra, and at some point we'll put a picture of her up showing her unusually developed habits. But my other friend who's been with me all my life is uh, this chap here. Mr. Death, he's been a, a lifelong friend and not an enemy and someone I've never been frightened of. When I was a very young boy and I used to go out on walks with my parents here in the Yorkshire Pennines, there are lots of old churches with graveyards and I used to wander around these. And as soon as I could read, I started to look at the headstones and what was written on them, the epitaphs and all the information. And you'd see one grave overgrown with ivy and perhaps moss and it would say Sarah Hardcastle died aged 43 plus six infants and then the next grave would say Ebenezer Smith died 1828 age 97 and I thought this is very strange some of these people die when they're children or babies and others live to be almost a hundred years old. Why is this? And I used to ask my parents and I used to ask the Sunday school teacher and later the vicar and my teachers and no one could answer this question. They said, oh, well, that's just the way it is. The religious people said, well, it's God's will. That's what was meant to happen. The next part of this journey happens when I'm about eight years old and I'm playing football in the school playground with my friends and suddenly I decide to walk away from this and I just go and lean against the wall and I get this overwhelming feeling that I have been here before. I've been not at this school, not in this place, but I have been on this planet before and it became an absolute conviction from that age and by the time I got into my teenage years and first started flirting with esoteric ideas in a very basic way and attempting to read some of Blavatsky's works when I was 17 or 18, which is not necessarily the most advisable thing to do. By this point, I was fascinated by the subject of death. And yet, in the culture that we live in, whenever you mention death, it's described as morbid. It's regarded as a distasteful topic of conversation in some way, something to be avoided until it's nearly here. A few years ago, 24 years ago, in fact, when my father died, 
I was with him in the hospice most days, but I lived quite a long way away. And unfortunately he died and I wasn't with him. And later the nurse told me that immediately before he died, he was terrified and he just didn't know what was going to happen. And this really upset me at the time because it struck me that so many people don't think about death, which after all is something we all have to do, apart from breathing and eating and all the rest of it. This is one thing that is going to come to all of us sooner or later. So why do we put it off? Why do we defer it as a topic of conversation, an area of study? And this is for all sorts of reasons. It's for religious reasons and scientific reasons and because of the prevailing mentality in what is, after all, a predominantly materialistic world in which we live. But for the last few years, I've been writing this book called Everyone's Book of the Dead. And um, I called it that because there's a Tibetan book of the dead and a Mexican book of the dead and an Egyptian book of the dead. So I thought, you know, we ought to be a bit more democratic here and create a book of the dead for everyone. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in a moment. But why did I write this? Well, the principal reason, apart from finding it a fascinating topic, is that one of the most important things we need to do as a species at the moment is to realize who we are. It's because we don't know who we are. We just think of ourselves as flesh and bone. It's because of this that we create so many problems. If we knew our true identities, we would behave very differently. So I wanted people to understand that these terms, death and life, are relative terms. There is nothing but life. And whether we live that life in a physical body, in incarnation on this earth, or whether we do it in the after death states in some incorporeal way makes little or no difference. And yet we describe it as life and death, annihilation, oblivion, end of consciousness, and all the rest of it. And because of this, because of this prevailing mindset that death is somehow the end of everything, it's feared. And this fear sometimes stalks people throughout their lives. I know many people who are absolutely terrified at the prospect of death. Indeed, this is why we go to such elaborate lengths to prolong life. And this is a debate in itself. Of course, the survival instinct is absolutely hardwired and inbuilt into us so that we want to survive. But I also wanted, apart from taking away the fear of death, is to try and show in some way that death is part of a continuum, an eternal journey, if you like, that we're all on, in and out of physical bodies. And so in this book, I explore death from a number of perspectives. I look at the actual process of dying itself. I look at people's attitudes to death. I look at what happens after we die immediately and in the afterlife realms and look at then how we are re-embodied, how we're re-embodied, why, what's involved in the process. I've also looked at the two most important things which are associated with death and which are the dynamic of it, if you like, which are the notions, the twin interlocking laws of karma, the law of cause and effect, and reincarnation. These two things are threaded together like a DNA spiral. You can't really have one without the other. I also look at various historical traditions regarding death and funerary practices and burials and so on. And these have often been extremely elaborate over the years, particularly for high status individuals. But what most of them show the vast, vast majority of them show is that there has always been this belief in the continuity of life across history, across time, across countries, across different geographies. And this belief that death is somehow the end is a comparatively new belief. 
and it's been compounded by materialistic science which has arisen over the last 400 years or so but also by the fact that christianity decided to abandon the idea of reincarnation in the sixth century at the second council of constantinople in 553 a.d although this had been on the agenda for at least a couple of centuries before that had not the church abandoned one of its core beliefs, think how differently the world would be today. Basically, it's very, very important that we reevaluate what death is all about. And this may be actually a survival tool. And I, I don't think I'm understating that. Why is it so important that we understand this and that we understand the laws of karma and reincarnation? Madame Blavatsky, 130, 140 years ago, said that this was the single most important thing that humanity had to understand. And it's important for a number of reasons, chiefly because if we know that we really reap the rewards or the sorrows of the seeds that we sow, then it's going to modify our behavior. If we knew that we were going to return to this planet and face all the problems that we ourselves collectively and individually have created, then I suspect that that would modify our behavior in a very, very significant way. And if we knew that everything that we do in this life, everything that we feel, everything we think, and everything that we say, sends out long lasting vibrations, which will eventually impact on us all again. So by redefining what death is all about, by understanding that it's part of this eternal journey, we are liberating ourselves um, in, in many ways, certainly from the fear of death, but we're also creating a much wider degree of responsibility and morality. And these are words which are sometimes regarded as old-fashioned in a world which is becoming increasingly amoral, if not immoral. So there is this ethical side tied up to all this. And it, if we believe that our individual behavior and thoughts and words and deeds don't matter, then we are shirking our spiritual responsibility because this is what we are, and it's been said before, that we are not bodies who happen to have spirits. We are spirits who happen to be in bodies at a particular time. Let's just remind ourselves of the, the, the theosophical basics of this for those who don't know, but I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted. Theosophy and many other esoteric principles say that basically there are two parts to us and that we have seven different aspects to ourselves, four lower ones and three higher ones. It's the three higher ones which make up what theosophy calls the individuality. And it's that part which continually reincarnates, modified, of course, over time. The lower personality, our physical bodies, astral, etheric, and lower mental bodies are all ultimately destroyed after we die. This is the transient personality that we bring into each life. And the word personality is a very interesting one because it comes from the Greek word persona for mask. And, and in each life, it's almost as if we come into it playing a different part. If we use the works of Shakespeare as an example, in one life, I'm King Lear. In, in the next life, I'm Richard II. In the next life, I'm Cordelia. In the life after that, I'm Mark Antony. So we all come in to this world, which is almost like a giant repertory theater where we keep putting on these different plays. One of the interesting things that the book explores is evidence for reincarnation. And I've spoken to this about this before at the European school, so I won't go into it in any great depth. But it also shows that we come into this life, not just through some kind of individual choice, but there seems to be a dynamic 
there seems to be some kind of karmic script. We seem to belong to different groupings of souls or egos who constantly reincarnate together to play out this karmic script in some way, to pay off obligations, to develop new opportunities. And in each life, these different parts of this group of souls take on very different roles. We have different relationships with each other. In one life, I'm your mother. In the next, I'm your worst enemy. Then I'm your sister. Then I'm a business associate. These may be communities of interest rather than just family groupings. But it's also quite clear that people from different countries in the past, different civilizations, have tended to reincarnate again in some collective way at some point in the future. It's often said, for example, by a number of writers that people who lived in ancient Greece reincarnated in large numbers in places like France. And France and Greece share a lot of things, love of beauty, romance, aesthetics, uh, nice living. Whereas people from the Roman Empire who were much more pragmatic and had a much more brutal sense of things and a much higher degree of administration and law, they tended to forsake beauty and aesthetics for functionality and efficiency. And it's said that many of those people would have reincarnated in places like Germany and Britain, where there is much, a much greater degree of organization. And of course, people like Edgar Cayce, the sleeping prophet, when he did one of his many, many thousands of life readings, he drew many parallels. In fact, about half his, his readings mention the lost continent of Atlantis. And he says quite clearly that many of the people who were in incarnation then are in incarnation now. Interestingly enough, making many of the same mistakes which seem to have led to the demise of Atlantis in a number of different stages, the last one 12,000 years ago. And I think this stuff is actually very, very interesting. And while it's very difficult, if not impossible, to convince skeptical people of the reality of reincarnation, these things do show various pointers and evidence to show that this might be the case. One of the things that I have been researching and I have included in the book to some degree is evidence uh, that there is such a thing as reincarnation. And one of the most interesting parts of this um, has been something that's been going on for 50 or 60 years now. And this is where you take people and you use hypnosis to regress them to past lives. And this has produced some fascinating material. And this is not kind of quirky fringe science. This has been done by respected academics, some of whom started off thinking it was just complete superstition to believe in reincarnation, but who, after conducting many, many hundreds or indeed thousands of these regressions, found themselves absolutely convinced by the evidence. And in many cases, well, in one particular case, there was a, a psychiatrist who was suffering from terrible, terrible stomach problems. And he'd been down all the normal medical routes to try and work out what this problem was and how to cure it. And nothing had worked. So he went to a hypnotist and the hypnotist took him back to a life in Mexico in the early part of the 19th century. And during this hypnotic regression session, he realized that um, he'd been hit in the stomach by a prison guard with the butt of a rifle. And this had caused something which had somehow reverberated into this life. Now, interestingly, after this session, within literally a few hours, all the pain and the discomfort that he felt throughout his life just vanished. So there is a, a deeper purpose to all this, as well as discovering past lives. They do seem to have an incredible therapeutic value. And people do seem to be able to um, get over things which they have accumulated in the past life and brought in 
to this one. So it's been a way of clearing a passage or wiping the slate clean in some sort of way. And in fact, many people who come into this life, many of the illnesses um, and the other things which are unpleasant in our lives will have karmic backgrounds to them. In fact, perhaps almost everything that we do will have a karmic background to it. So this is another reason I wanted to write this book because I want people to understand that there is such a law. Now, when we use the word karma, which comes from the Sanskrit word kri, which means action or to make or to do, it denotes some kind of activity. If we'd been sitting here 60, 70 years ago, just after the Second World War, and someone had used the word karma, the vast majority of people wouldn't even have understood what it meant outside a few closed esoteric circles. It was only when we got into the 1960s and people started embracing these alternative ideas from the East and the Beatles started meditating with yogis and many other things happened that karma actually got into the English language. Uh, was that John Lennon song, wasn't that? Instant karma. And that was perhaps the moment when it entered mainstream vocabulary. But now it's something everybody understands. And people often misuse the word thinking that it's something that happens immediately after an event has taken place. However, I think it's also this idea that, that every cause has an effect is taking hold in the collective consciousness of mankind. And if we believe in this law of karma, and if we see it operating, then it, it means that really the, there aren't accidents, there isn't chance or fate or fortune or luck or kismet or any of these things. And maybe there isn't even synchronicity, although obviously that does appear from time to time. Everything has a cause, even if we don't know what it is. Everything has a cause, and that cause may lie in the very distant past. Now, one of the things I've also dealt with here, and when you're talking to skeptical people and uh, you know, working in journalistic circles for so many years, you meet an awful lot of skeptical people, um, ultra skeptical people. And one of the things they always say is, well, if there is such a thing as reincarnation, why can't we remember our past lives? Well, clearly, if you go into hypnotic regression and under certain other circumstances, it is possible to remember um, past lives. But they say, OK, I can't remember my past life, so therefore it didn't happen. But when you think about it, there are, there are very good and compelling reasons why we're not privilege to the information that's necessarily gone on because we have been we, we still are an unevolved species we still are children or at the best unruly teenagers on this planet we've yet to reach any kind of adulthood and therefore the things that we've done in the past the acts that we've got up to the acts of extreme brutality and selfishness and all the other human evils that you can imagine. Would we want to be burdened with those things in this life? And this is why so many spiritual and religious traditions talk about when we are reborn, we go through some symbolic river of forgetfulness or some other way in which our memories are erased so that we can cope. Here on Earth, we have a mechanism to protect ourselves against unpleasant memories in a dustbin called the subconscious or the unconscious, where we can retrieve all those things that we've chosen to repress. Because if we, in our everyday lives, were burdened by things that we ourselves had done, then it would be difficult to operate. We would have such a, a, a feeling of shame and guilt and perpetual anguish that we wouldn't be able to operate and do what we're here to do, which is to learn and to evolve and to develop. So it's a protection mechanism. It still doesn't convince the skeptics at all. 
Another thing that they did, interestingly, when they were doing these hypnotic regressions, they also did hypnotic progressions and asked people to try and incarnate in the future or the future as we understand it on the physical plane. And the results of this were extremely interesting. Um, I think they took a sample of about a thousand people and asked them to incarnate in the years 2100 and 2300, not very far down the line from here. And out of those thousand people, I think only around 85, 86, 87 could incarnate at that time. And what they found was not very uh, pleasant at all. They found uh, a degraded earth and what's often described as some kind of post-apocalyptic environment. Now, I don't want to scare you all about that, and uh, maybe this uh, is uh, far-fetched. But nevertheless, it shows that we do actually have access to all these things within ourselves, all this memory and knowledge, if we choose to access it. So the purpose really of the book has been, as I've said, threefold, to get people to understand themselves, to understand the process of death and to take the fear away from that. And one of the things that I think we will have to do in the future is we are going to have to entirely reassess many things about death. And indeed, this has started to happen um, because of what's happened to us all over the last 12 or 14 months. Death is around us all the time, but it's been thrown into a, a much sharper focus over the past 12 or 14 months because of the COVID pandemic, which has touched everybody on this planet directly or indirectly. And I suspect that this might be a way, um, almost a hidden way perhaps, of getting people to reconsider this. Because if you, if you listen to the radio or um, listen to people speaking about death, now they say, oh, and so many people have so tragically died. Well, is death a tragedy or is it a reality? It's almost like we've come to expect that unless we live to a certain particular age and unless we have a particular way of living, then we have somehow not succeeded in this life. But it's quite clear that if we are to play all these different roles in each of our lives here on Earth, then we're not going to have exactly the same circumstances each time. In fact, quite the contrary. We're going to have to experience everything that human beings can experience, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, in order that we can eventually progress to higher realms, whatever they may be, and wherever they may be in the superhuman kingdoms. So this means that some lives are going to be very brutish, some are going to be very short, some are going to be very squalid. And a few times we're going to have perhaps a more pleasant time. But we, we should understand what the earth is all about. I mean, it, it's not totally unpleasant, but at the same time, it's not a paradise because we've chosen not to create the paradise, which we potentially could if we were more sophisticated. And therefore, the earth represents one of the harsh halls of learning. It's, it's almost like um, a very strict school where we come here to learn very, very harsh lessons. And often those lessons are learned via suffering. But interestingly, when they did these hypnotic regression sessions, one of the things that added a lot of authenticity to them was that when they looked back at the particular period in which people said they'd led their previous lives. Their knowledge of that time was often exceptional. They could describe geographical details, historical details, details of cooking utensils, architecture, and numerous other everyday things, often better than the experts in that field. But perhaps even more persuasively, 
when they looked at the social divide amongst the people, they found that 65 to 70 percent were ordinary working people, maybe 20, 25 percent were of a middle class, but only about 5 percent represented any kind of aristocracy or ruling class. And this accurately represented um, the likely social makeup of those particular societies in which they lived. So when you add all this up and you look at all the different circumstances uh, that we have to go through, then in its own way, this new view of death is quite liberating because we all go through very difficult times in life. We all go through tragedies and, and disappointments of one sort or another and setbacks. But if we know that we are on some kind of ongoing journey, then we can just look on this life or this part of this life for exactly what it is. It's just an experience. Now, I know it's difficult to understand that sometimes, uh, particularly when things get really rough and tough for us. But if we can step back and say, well, what is this in terms of a series of hundreds or if not thousands of incarnations. This represents a few days or a few weeks of something which has lasted for thousands or millions of years and which will continue to last. And I think having this longer term view beyond what is physical around us is extremely powerful. And I think it's, it's one of the best ways we have of liberating our own spirits and everything. But nevertheless, it's going to be a long time before attitudes to death change significantly. They are, they are changing. And, you know, when they've done research recently in America and Europe into the number of people who believe in some form of rebirth, it's between usually a quarter and a third of people. 50 years ago, it would have been 1% or even less than that. So these things are changing. However, I think that's yet to be translated into a lot of attitudes which, which people have, um, perhaps unnecessarily keeping people alive longer than would be um, perhaps desirable. But I think also what it means is that we're going to evolve new means of uh, helping people to die. And a lot of work has been done in this in recent years. The hospitals have become much better at this than they ever were in the past. And the hospice movement has been absolutely fantastic in being able to give appropriate palliative care to the dying. Um, but I think in the future, it's suggested we may make much greater use of things like sound and color. Because if we've had a good life, why do we automatically have to have a bad death. We don't. Death, in many ways, is the crowning achievement of this life. Now, if you said that to ordinary people, it might make them extremely angry, but it is. It is the climax to this life. And therefore, the way that we leave this life is very, very important. Many of the uh, leading esoteric writers and certainly the masters, the Mahatmas, have spoken about this that the conditions and the circumstances of our departure are very important. If, for example, we have relatives who are highly emotional and weeping around the bed, this can make things extremely difficult because it can set up attachments. And we are told that how we feel as we depart this life actually impacts on what happens to us in the immediate after death states and so it's very important to understand that when dying quiet and contemplation is needed four years ago i was with my very good friend ruby Tovet when she died and i was with her daughter as well and we were spent the last four or five hours with her during which time she was not apparently conscious, but I knew that she understood um, the soft 
words we were saying. You could, you know, I just knew this. And this process of dying, I think in her case, it was very peaceful and it was very gentle. And if anybody was frightened of death, if they had seen her death, they would have been encouraged by it because her daughter also um, understood about these ideas that this time is of crucial importance. Because remember what's happening at this time. As soon as our physical body is dead, we still have other principles which are alive, the etheric body, the energizing principle of our physical bodies doesn't die immediately. It takes some hours, sometimes perhaps 36 or 48 hours before it finally dissolves. Also, another thing which does seem to happen, and this has been reported by medical staff and hospice workers, and by those who've been with people who've died, they often seem to be accompanied in the room by presences or entities that those around him, them can't see. Now, one presumes this must be some sort of connection to the imminent arrival that they're going to have in the astral world. Perhaps it's a connection to this astral world. These people may be dead family members. They may be other people. But it's quite clear that this happens, not in every instance, but certainly in a great many instances. And I, I presume that this is something which is very important. One thing that's associated very much with death is what we call out of the body experiences. And these can be triggered by all sorts of things, by sudden shocks, by uh, the use of chemicals, by many different things. They sometimes happen in wartime when um, a shell explodes near someone, doesn't kill them, but gives them such a shock. But increasingly, it's been reported in recent years because of uh, the increasing effectiveness of medical technology. And it often happens um, when people have severe accidents and they see themselves out of their bodies. But it also happens in places like operating theatres. And people see themselves floating above their bodies as the surgeons and, and other medical staff are working on them. And often they come back and they report conversations that have gone on or the fact that one of the doctors dropped a scalpel on the floor or a bird flew into the window. But during these out of the body experiences or near death experiences, and the two are not exactly the same, but they do share some of the same properties and hallmarks, is when people have these out of the body experiences, they tend to walk down a passageway or a tube or a funnel of, and they emerge into bright light. They're often met by other people there, perhaps people they don't know, spiritual beings, if they're very religious, Jesus, Buddha, um, or family members or others. And sometimes they're taken on a journey into this place, which is nearly always described as being incredibly beautiful as a landscape. Often there's beautiful music playing and they're taken on this journey. And then eventually they reach a point a barrier of some kind, a wall, a cliff, a stream, a river. And they're told, right, this is as far as you can go. You have to go back uh, to where you were on the physical plane. And many people are extremely reluctant. They say, no, 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 I'm home. This is where I want to stay. No, it's not your time. You have to go back. And this is reported again and again and again. And people come back. Um, are reunited with their bodies after the operation or whatever trauma has triggered this. And in many cases, they are quite resentful of the fact that they've had to come back. You know, the, most people would imagine that if you'd just been saved, you know, in life-saving surgery or been rescued from an accident, you would be grateful. But in many cases, people are not. And I think I'll wind up by just quoting another little bit of research, which um, is not meant to depress you, but um, seems to offer hope that uh, the after death states may be rather more pleasant than some of the states we have here in the physical world. And that is during these regression sessions, they've asked people to talk about how they felt immediately prior to taking a new body. 
in quite a large proportion um, didn't really want to do it, but knew they had to. Many of them showed a great reluctance um, or a degree of foreboding. And only a relatively small proportion of people actually wanted to come back into a physical body on Earth. Now, I think that's quite um, significant, but it's not a matter of choice, is it? We're all going to have to do this again and again and again until we become uh, much better boys and girls and uh, learn to understand ourselves and the universe much better. So death is something we should talk about much more. It shouldn't be something which is just stuffed there in the closet. This is how we used to be with other things. Um, at, at one time, you know, people in England um, wouldn't talk about sex because it was seen as somehow a taboo subject and possibly in other countries as well. Now people talk about sex all the time. And I wish people would talk about death as much as they talked about sex because if we talk about it, we can understand it. If we understand it, we don't fear it. If we don't fear it, we can cooperate with it. And this is what we should do. And we should understand that life here, as well as being harsh and tough sometimes, can also be extremely pleasant. And it can also be extremely creative and productive as well. Because what we're all doing now, consciously or unconsciously, by our thoughts and by our actions, and by our words and everything about ourselves, is we are effectively creating the raw materials for our next life and directly or indirectly creating the circumstances of that next life. So we can play a part in this. We can decide to get rid of the habits we don't want. We can decide to take on new skills, which we can take with us, unlike our bank balances, because we, can, we can't take those with us when we die, but we can take the accumulated knowledge, skills, and everything else that we've learned during this life. And we can build on those skills in the next life. So life can be a creative, but somewhat challenging process at the moment. And when we see the way that death should fit into it, and when we understand that death as popularly understood is a complete myth and the biggest bit of fake news ever, then that will help to free ourselves from the fear of it. Um, I think I've spoken for far too long. Um, thank you very much indeed for listening. If you do have any questions, um, I'll almost certainly not be able to answer them, but I'll do my best. Thank you again for listening. Thank you, thank you for the lecture. You did not ask me to share uh, Electra's, Electra's picture. I thought you- Oh, well, um, you can now if you like. Yeah. Um, would you like to say something about it? Yes, indeed. Um, like many of you, I'm a, a fan of the secret doctrine and uh, uh, obviously the full version is not for everybody. So I didn't want to be a, a cruel and unusual pet owner. So I started her off on the abridgment. It's a wonderful abridgment by Christmas Humphreys and uh, Elizabeth Preston, which I think was produced in the 1960s. And it's fantastic, this book. I use it all the time when I'm trying to find particular things because it's only about 250 pages. And as you can see, she's read so much, she's just gone to sleep for a little while, but uh, her study course is continuing. And I think that she might pass it on to other members of the feline community eventually. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is there any question, please? Oh yeah. Linda, I'm gonna invite you to unmute yourself, please. I'm asking you to unmute yourself. Graham, I enjoyed your lecture very much today. Congratulations. We are looking forward to one of your lecture here at the school. I will open your mic later. Uh, Linda, please. Yes. 
I, I did it before and then I was muted again, but I guess this time. Okay. Work. Yeah, where are you? Yeah, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Tim. That was fascinating. I always find your talks fascinating. Do you have any idea why uh, Christianity decided to take reincarnation out of their teachings? Well, it's a, a complicated and tortuous process. It had been going on in one way or another since, I think, round about the third century. I mean, it's, it's not something I'm a great expert on. But when they finally came to vote on it um, in 552, a lot of it was to do um, with the Holy Roman Emperor's wife, Theodora. And one of the problems was that she was, um, shall we say, a rather lustful woman who'd had many lovers. Well, I mean, I suppose that's not necessarily a bad thing, but in her case, it was particularly bad because she had most of them killed afterwards. And so she didn't really want to have to face up to her responsibilities. And so she got uh, behind the scenes and managed to um, get them to mm -hmm. vote against it. But even so, it was, it was basically a political thing. It was down to uh, the voting because there was the Eastern Church then, as well as the, the Church of Rome, and it was all a competing faction. The Pope wasn't even there when um, they took this vote. He'd been warned to stay away for his own safety. But it had all been brewing from about the third century. And some of the early Christian fathers, like um, I suppose Oregon, uh, Origen, had, um, had talked about reincarnation. But eventually these things were declared anathema. Uh, that's just a potted version of it. There are whole books which have been written on this. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating area, but it was quite a slow burn. It took two, two and a half centuries for it finally to be extinguished. But indeed, these days, um, you find that, particularly amongst Catholics, there is um, quite a strong belief among some of them, in some cases up to about a quarter or a third, who do believe in reincarnation. It's less amongst the Protestant sects, particularly amongst people like Methodists and Congregationalists. Um, so in some ways, I guess there are always people who are going to go against the teachings of the religion itself, because somehow I think human beings have this intuitional knowledge that they've been here before and will be here again. Thank you. Um, we do have a question that Mary and Ed would like to ask. Uh, Mary, could you please unmute yourself? Uh, yes, I have uh, three points. Um, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the authority on the English language, the word karma came into popular use because of Sinnott's book, Esoteric Buddhism. So until that he wrote that book, the term karma was simply a technical term for Asian scholars. So theosophy actually introduced uh, karma into the popular language. Uh, another point is on reincarnation. Uh, Geddes McGregor, as some of you may know, was a Christian scholar. He wrote a book on reincarnation in Christianity. And he said that the, uh, uh, the idea of reincarnation while always a minor idea in Christianity, did exist in the early centuries, especially in the Eastern Church. Now, of course, as you all know, I'm sure, there was always a rivalry between the Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of Constantinople vying for power. So whatever came from the East, the Roman uh, uh, Pope uh, rejected. He didn't, didn't popularize it. So the actual idea of reincarnation was never condemned by the Roman church. What was condemned was Origenism, and it was suspicious uh, whether Origen taught reincarnation or not. So no one knows for sure whether Origen uh, taught reincarnation. Uh, so one can still uh, accept reincarnation and be a member of the Roman Catholic Church. And the last thing I wanted to say was about memory. Uh, since the usual process after death is the disintegration of the brain and eventually the psychic, psyche, that is where memories are stored. So of course we wouldn't remember because they're gone. 
in cases of quick reincarnation where the same psyche is reincarnated, then of course we can remember. Most hypnotic regressions are not uh, accurate, not provable anyway. Um, so um, I think that the real reason we don't remember things, while it's very nice not to remember the horrors of the past, is that we couldn't possibly remember them if the previous psyche and brain uh, has been disintegrated. Well, of course, um, we all have access to things other than the physical brain. I mean, there are the Akashic records um, on the astral plane, which can be accessed. Um, anyway, I, I, one thing I would say um, uh, about your um, first comment about um, karma. Um, yes, it's interesting the way that uh, perhaps I didn't know this about Sinit. But what is interesting, I think, Ed, is the fact that so many theosophical ideas have gradually percolated into mainstream thought, not through any mm -hmm. loud trumpeting of them, but through a quiet process of osmosis, almost. But I think that karma came into certainly popular, the popular imagination during the 1960s, and particularly because of people like John Lennon who was hugely influential at that time. And although it may have been um, there as an academic term or a, a specialist term, I don't ever remember hearing that word as a child, but so suddenly as we got into the 1960s and the alternative culture, people started suddenly talking about it all the time. And people were then reading all sorts of um, Eastern uh, books about Buddhism and other religions and so on. Anyway, thank you very much for your comments, Ed. Yes, uh, thank you, Tim, uh, for your talk. And uh, you're absolutely right about it becoming widespread, uh, karma becoming widespread uh, in usage uh, in the 60s. Uh, certainly, I, I'm 85 years old, and I remember I don't remember ever hearing about karma until I came into theosophy. So you are quite right about that. It's just that the OED says the, that it actually began uh, way back with Sinnott's book. It didn't become truly popular, of course, until the 1960s. I think you're quite right on that. So thank you for your talk again. Okay, thank you, Ed, thank you. Uh, Lindsay, the next question over to you, I believe, if you can unmute yourself. You're yeah, I think I have, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. So it's not a question, it's just um, an anecdote I thought you might find interesting. As some of you know that I'm a homeopath and some years ago I had a patient come, she had difficulties with breathing. She had been treated for asthma um, and didn't seem to work, but just carried on. So I gave her a constitutional remedy as one does. And she started to have dreams where she would wake up in panic, feeling claustrophobic. And I tried to get her to explain what was going on. And she told me it, she felt as if she was being gassed. Um, so we talked about it and I said that, well, did she believe in reincarnation? Because possibly um, she had been gassed as a Jew and she seemed to think that was true. So I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat you as if you're being gassed in this life. Mm -hmm. And I did. And she was completely cured. Oh, wow. Well, that's very, very interesting because I think that was, I think these, that, these, these um, matters particularly brought over from past lives, once they're somehow recognized and confronted, like the doctor I mentioned who'd been hit in the stomach with the rifle butt apparently in a, a previous life, as soon as it was recognized what the cause of this was, then it had this hugely um, therapeutic mm -hmm. effect. And... Um, just to go back to what perhaps Ed was saying, I mean, these things are something that don't convince, th these hypnotic regression sessions or what you just described don't convince the skeptics because nothing will. But nevertheless, these things do have a very, very um, healing effect. And, uh, you know, it shows that we have within ourselves much greater self-healing capacities than perhaps would be recognized by medical science and certainly the large pharmaceutical companies who would prefer to profit from our illnesses rather than have us solve them ourselves. Over to Mike. 
Uh, <clears throat> hi, Tim. It's, hi, Tim. It's me again. Oh, hello, Mike. Uh, Tim, have you any thoughts on why people, when they're going through the, they're just about to die, they wait until people have left the room? Yes, I've had experience of this directly. Um, me personally, I, I prefer to die alone rather. Than, I think this I is recognised. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is recognised by medical staff because certainly in my own case, when my mother was dying um, about twenty-five years ago. Um, she was in a local hospital and um, I went to see her um, about nine o'clock in the morning. And the nurse said to me, very, what turned out to be very dip diplomatically, would you um, like to just go home? It was only 10 minutes drive to my house and get some breakfast and then maybe come back. And as soon as I walked in the door, uh, the phone rang and uh, they said, oh, your mother passed five minutes ago. And I think she wanted to die alone. You're absolutely right, Mike. She didn't want to have me there with her for whatever reasons. And when I've spoken to other medical staff about this, when I've spoken to other medical staff about this, um, they've said to me, yeah, often this is what we do. We t and, and why they put patients inside wards and have special rooms, because it is such an intensely personal thing. And many people would feel very embarrassed by having other people with them because it is a very, very personal part of the journey that we undertake. So, yeah, uh, dying alone, you know, it's looked on as being something terrible, but perhaps it's the best thing that can happen to us, especially it's better to die alone than to, to die in a very inappropriate and highly emotionally charged situation, I would feel. Thank you, Tim. Um, I think Roberta, Roberta Ariali, you wrote a question. I lost connection and I cannot see the chat anymore. So please, uh, we have two more questions. Uh, it's Roberta and Gray, and, and then we will close our tonight session. Roberta, um, over to you, please. Yes, here I am. Thank you very much, Tim. It was really wonderful. And, uh, and I wish to ask only um, just a small question. Is there any witness uh, living of living people or, or just uh, they collect about colors and sounds in the after death, as you said before, something about it? Well, certainly um, the second generation theosophists, Annie Besant and Charles Leadbeater, wrote quite a lot about the astral plane and others have written about it as well. And they describe astral colors as being much more um, vibrant, rather different from colors the way that we perceive them on the astral plane. But of course, on the astral plane, we're not seeing through our physical eyes, are we? We're seeing through what would be our astral eyes. And it's said that the colors are much more subtle. There's a higher range of colors. And similarly with sound, it's said to be much more melodic and beautiful. Um, but I can't really elaborate on it um, any more than that. But it would seem to be the fact that um, certainly on the astral level and maybe on, um, on the David Chanik level as well, it would seem perhaps that these things are much richer and much more vibrant, perhaps because they're not filtered through our relatively crude physical senses. So um, I would suspect that we've got, I'm sure some painters have been able to kind of access these realms. Um, I'm thinking of people like Kandinsky, who I think was a theosophist and some of his works I, I like very much indeed. And it's almost like he's painting with a palette from a different realm. Thank you, Tim. I was just informed that there is in the chat Two questions uh, before Grayan, which is Karin and Hajmuk. I'm not sure, Karin, would you like to ask a question? I'm inviting you to unmute yourself, please. Yes, yes. thank you very much uh, for everything, Tim. It was a beautiful talk. I was wondering if um, in the after-death experiences, 
What is your opinion if, uh, for example, in the Buddhist tradition, they tell you exactly all the steps that you're going to go through when you die? Uh, and perhaps in other traditions also, I was just wondering, what's your feeling about this? Because is that what people experience or how we bring brainwashed in the way telling us that that's what we're going to experience. Therefore, we experience it. Mm. Well, I suppose anything can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's often said that, yes, because the astral realm is a subjective realm, it's not, it's not an objective plane like the earth. So it's based on our emotions and desires and, and lower mental thoughts and everything. So if someone of a fundamentalist Christian persuasion who believes in the devil and hell and all those sorts of things, um, that's probably what they will see because that is the product, the product of their own imagination. In terms of what the Buddhists talk about, well, there are a number of different Buddhist traditions, aren't there? And perhaps the best known one is the, you know, the Tibetan book where they talk about the bardo states, which are very complicated. But they, they basically say that people spend only 49 days out of incarnation. Um, and I guess much of what's written in these things is deeply symbolic. And trying to read it literally is like trying to read the Bible or any other uh, religious or scriptural text, absolutely literally, it's, it must be read um, with the key of symbolism, I think, more than uh, anything else. But I think the point you make about you, you get what you expect is an important one, because yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, evidence shows that this is what happens. And after death, people, it is said, uh, do congregate on different parts of the astral plane which suit them so that, you know, religious fundamentalists will be in one place, scientists might be in another place, and okay. the creative types, the musicians yeah. and the artists and the intellectuals might be in another place, and the deeply religious spiritual people will be in another place. So I, I guess, you know, even in the afterlife, as we say in English, birds of a feather flock together. And we will probably, all of us in, in a few years' time, be having a Zoom meeting on the astral plane, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the important um, thing is that the uh, HPB, on, um, in, the, in theosophy, we only have Jasper Neiman's uh, the sleeping spheres, where they describe what she was goes through, to the death, through death, which was the interest, very interesting part. But uh, there's not much spoken about it in theosophy, so it's interesting to discuss this. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Hasmok, is, is Hasmok there or he left? I think he left. So, Graham, over to you, please. Uh, okay, yes. Hi, Tim. Um, Hello, Graham. Um, uh, uh, thanks for your talk earlier on. It was great, by the way. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, and this could be the subject of a separate talk, but if you have some brief thoughts, seeing your cat made me wonder about ideas like transmigration of souls do you or theosophy believe that animals can get promoted and is reincarnation like earth limited or could we reincarnate on other planets in other galaxies and things like that um some spiritual teachers suggest ideas like that and even that people can there are inhabitants of jupiter except they're not living on the material plane they're living on the astral planes so i just wondered if you had any brief thoughts about any of those topics well, to deal with the first part, um, the theosophical teachings are that somewhere um, probably in the fourth root race, um, or maybe even earlier, but basically animals can no longer indi individualize, that is get individual souls and become part of the human kingdom um, until the next round. We're in the fourth round at the moment, and it is said that the door is now closed for animals to be promoted to the human kingdom until then. Can human beings be reborn um, as animals or indeed other kingdoms of nature? Well, many people, many traditions do talk of this. Uh, the theosophical view is that, no, this is absolutely not the case. Once you gravitated and graduated to the human kingdom in most cases, apart from a few exceptional 
failures, then this is where you are. I know that certainly in some traditions, um, they, they talk about, uh, uh, I'm, they talk about people coming back as trees or animals and that sort of thing. And I think in some indigenous traditions, uh, they talk about people coming back as eagles or deers or whatever. But certainly in the theosophical tradition, um, there is no such thought at all. Once you're human, you're stuck with it until you become uh, uh, superhuman. What um, a relief. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> to deal with the other part of your question, I don't think I can really um, offer very much on that. I have no direct knowledge about um, incarnation on other planets. And what we've got to be, what we've got to remember here is that in theosophy, we talk about planets, not just as physical planets like the earth, but planets made of astral matter or lower mental matter or other types of even more rarefied matter. So it's a question of whether we're talking about physically um, being in bodies. Well, I suppose reincarnation, that means literally to come into flesh again, uh, would mean having a, a physical body. As for other places, other planets, I don't know. But throughout a lot of the traditions, the religious and spiritual traditions, there are certain parts of the heavens which do seem to have connections with the earth, principally the star Sirius, which is a double or even a triple star, um, has been known for many thousands of years. And people talk about this connection with Sirius all the time. Uh, a number of writers talk about it. Alice Bailey talks about it quite a lot. And the other um, grouping, which is often talked about uh, and has been since the ancients, indeed, um, is the, the Pleiades. And these come up again and again and again um, as having some connection with the earth. But beyond and above that, I can't really say very much indeed. And my own level of knowledge um, wouldn't include that. It would be nice to kind of go, you know, if, if you've been incarnated on the earth uh, for so many hundreds of times, I mean, we all need a holiday. Um, so perhaps it would be nice to go to somewhere a bit more exotic and a bit less uh, harsh on the system than our present home. But I have no knowledge about whether this is possible, but we can live in hope, can't we? Thank you, Tina. Lavatki, that's Ashmok's question here. Just a minute, please. Mm -hmm. uh, just a minute, please. Uh, Tin, uh, uh, Blavatsky does mention about uh, other plan planets. For example, Sanat Kumara comes from Venus. She says in the secret doctrine that the bees and the wheat were brought from Venus. She talks about the lunar Petris or the lunar fathers and this very strong connection that Earth has with the moon. So there is a number of teachings in the secret doctrine about other planets. Now, yes, there's the Lords of the Flame as well, which is flame. talked about. Yeah, yeah. This is for Gray and he can look into that after. I also, I also do like to mention before asking the final question from Hajmuk that in 2018 in Pescia, Italy, which was actually the first time he gave a lecture to the European School of Theosophy, we focused on Memento Mori and we have printed a book on the proceedings of the European School of Theosophy, uh, focusing entirely on death and dying. So this book is available online for free and you can download it. Now, uh, over to the last, the last question is from Hasmuk, which is a very uh, large question. Tim, Hasmuk is asking you, what is your, what, uh, is your view about life as a whole? <laughs> right now. The purpose of life in, in two minutes. Purpose of life. Oh, yeah. Or uh, the purpose of life. What is the purpose of life? Your okay. Life. Well, oh, that's easy. Yeah, that's, that's very easy. Um, the purpose of life. Um, are you, is he talking about our, our lives or life in the universe? I believe Hasmuk, why don't you take the mic and you ask the question? I, I, I am I'm, I'm posting his private question here on the chat. You can read it. It's on the chat. Have a look in, please. 
but life as a whole let's have a look uh yeah okay well what we have to understand about life is that you know life is full of rhythms and we have slow rhythms and fast rhythms and life is about moods as well um I, i'm an incredibly moody person as people who know me well will tell you and you know i have my days and dark nights of the soul like everybody else but the purpose of it is that through all this bitter experience and painful things that we go through as well as all the pleasures and the joys and the wonderful things that we all experience it's often very easy to let all the bad stuff crowd in and i'm particularly guilty of this sometimes letting all the bad stuff of the immediate moment crowd out all the other achievements and wonderful things that have happened to you in life but i think after a time you do reach a point where you can start to even things out a little bit um it's it's not always easy but we're here to learn we're here to evolve um we're part of the universe helping to understand itself better we have an important role here uh because as we um each as connected components of the universe evolve that means the universe itself or the the universal mind or the all or god or whatever you want to call it gets to know itself better and we play a purpose in that one of the things i would say is that and conventional education and and science and religion have done too much to downgrade what human beings actually are we have incredible latent potential and even you know the most enlightened people can't imagine what the full depths of that are but many esoteric writers have compared us we are a microcosm of the macrocosm the universe and i think that because we have doubted our abilities we can reach a point now where we can undergo some major kind of upgrade but we've got to give ourselves the permission to do it and accept the fact that this would be possible and if we do that then we make life even more meaningful and more purposeful thank you so much tim several people have asked how they can obtain copies of your book and i um, said that the your new website is at the top of the chat if anyone would like to see it but if you would like to mention how they can get your book Yes if you just go on to the website um and just order it uh there the book um hasn't arrived from the printers it should be arriving within the next 2 or 3 days i understand um the website itself will not be going live until maybe tuesday or wednesday but after that you should be able to obtain the book and indeed some of my other products um on there as well musical products and other books and uh books by one or two other people as well although i prefer that you bought mine rather than the other people's so that will be going live sometime i should give it towards thursday or friday and it should all be uh, up and running by then thank you so much so thank you everyone next week we have next saturday we have the opening of the seminar with dr ravi ravindra which we will run for seven saturdays and next sunday we have a lecture i think with petra mayer um juliet would you like to say something i'd like to say thank you to everyone for coming um with us this evening please remember that we are a not for profit profit platform so we do appreciate any donations that you would might like to make and also please remember to send any names that you would like us to include into our healing book and thank you again for attending our healing circle earlier stay safe and have a wonderful week and see you next saturday with dr ravinda thank you so much team for our wonderful lecture again i wish you all a nice week we will see you soon thank well, you very much thank bye you bye bye brilliant talk